Um, so, thanks uh, Anu for the introduction and uh, in the next 40 minutes or so, I will take you through this rather interesting and evolving area that, that will I am sure play a you know, greater role in our lives as we go forward. Um, so, start with this picture which is uh, which is a collection of cells that all of us are made up of and for this audience you know, think of cells as processors. So, each cell is a processor, you know, it does some computation. And this is a truly distributed system in the sense that every every cell is running its own process. What's remarkable about this distributed system is that, unlike a typical one that we use you know, from a programming perspective, where there is a master controller, so to say, which splits up the problem, breaks it up, you know, gives it to the individual nodes, uh, monitors the nodes as they go along, making sure they're doing what they're supposed to do, and then collects back the results and so on. It's very centrally driven. This distributed system, on the other hand, is completely truly distributed in the sense there's no central controller at all. Every cell executes its own program and does whatever it feels like in, in, in a way. And in spite of that, somehow all the cells together cooperatively manage to keep a, um, a particular you know, organism or a human being, for instance, uh, functional and coherent and you know, focused in some way. So how does that happen? What is common amongst all these cells, all these processors? that unifies them and makes them all not run in different directions, but you know, cooperatively do something together. What is common is that they all execute essentially the same program, and that's what unifies them. Other than that, there's nothing that unifies them. So they all execute exactly the same program. And somehow the program is such that it forces all of them into discipline and making you know, all of them work cooperatively. So what is that program? Um, so deep inside, the cells you see, you saw those black regions called the nucleus inside the nucleus. Uh, if you had a powerful enough um, sort of microscope, so to say, um, you could actually see all the way down to what's called the DNA, and we all know it looks like this. And somewhere inside that is the program that uh, that actually every every one of these cells executes. We know today, over several years of development, that the program that's sitting inside, uh, inside that DNA is, um, we know the alphabet that that program is made up of, and it's it's the uh, it's four just four letters A, G, C, and T, just like you know, a computer program would be you know, written typically in the Roman alphabet or the English alphabet, so A to A to Z and one to ten, and so on. Um, here there are just four characters, so we know that much, but but. Uh, Unlike computer programs where we are able to look at big chunks and big functions and say this is what it does, our ability to look at this program at such a high level is still very primitive. Um, this program is exceedingly long, so it's uh, you know, 3 billion in length. And the task that confronts us today is that imagine somebody gave you a program, let alone 3 billion, it's, you know, a couple of hundred thousand lines, I'm sure you'll struggle with going through it to figure out what it is doing, and that's in spite of knowing all the higher level constructs, in spite of knowing how things work. And here we know much less. So that's that's the challenge that we are confronted with today. Um, now, if there if there's a program that every one of these cells executes, uh, so let's think of this program. It's it's running. What are the variables in this program? So the variables happen to be um, a number of molecules that sit inside these cells. There are literally hundreds, maybe a, you know, a good guess would be hundreds of thousands of molecules that uh, that hang around in these in, in each cell, and uh, the the level or the amount of each molecule is is the variable value. So the variables are the molecules. The amount, let's say, how many copies are there of glucose, how many copies of ATP, those would be the variable values that this program works with. So the state of the program is the, the value for each of these variables. And as the program evolves, it's going to change the values of these variables as it goes along. And why is it changing? I guess it has a goal in mind. And the goal sort of, it, it's, a, it's a very high level goal. It's called survival, meaning I need to make sure the cell survives. I need to make sure the organism survives. I need to make sure the species survives as a whole. So the computation happens towards that end. And at a low level, what's happening is that these variables are being constantly modulated by the program. These variables are being modulated, there are, and there are two types of variables, so to say. These molecules, some molecules come in from the outside. So you drink water, that's a new molecule that goes into your cells. You breathe oxygen, that's another molecule that goes in. And there are molecules that are created from within. So what are these molecules that are created from within? 
Um, so this big program that I talked about, this three three billion long, has certain parts of it dedicated uh, to um, to describing these molecules. Uh, these parts are called genes. Uh, these parts, so that box, for instance, is a little little part of the entire three billion, and that's that box describes the the you can think of it as a recipe for creating one of those small, one of those hundred no several hundred thousand molecules that inhabit the cell so this recipe actually lays out in great detail how exactly that molecule should be looked like how it should be assembled and so on right. so it's just a you know so how what what the description is is less important to us but the fact that it's a description that describes that molecule is all we care about so this program contains embedded inside it descriptions of 100,000 molecules that uh, that this program can at will so to say uh, start assembling and manufacturing um, th notice that this description is not one contiguous ch chunk of the program it's sort of many small pieces and that adds a little bit of complexity though I just wanted to point that out but that's not important for this talk so we have about a hundred thousand molecules that are coming in from whose descriptions are embedded in this program and then there are many other molecules that are coming in from the outside and now what is the goal of these molecules so when molecules come in from the outside the cell as I said the program is geared towards survival it's it's got to take action when molecules come in from the outside to ensure that if those are harmful molecules for instance then their levels are re reduced if they're useful molecules maybe their levels are kept up or amplified etc now so those variables, the molecules that come in from outside, those variables are not set by this program. They are being set by the environment. What this program can do is, in response to that, take one of the molecules whose recipes lies inside the program and increase the level, so increase the variable value of this variable. And, and this particular molecule that gets synthesized from this recipe will actually do something to the molecule that came in. Maybe it will destroy it or maybe it will change its nature in some form. And that is the computation that the cell is running, and that is the computation that ensures that the cell survives. So I want to give you an example of that, and uh, an example of a very small example of what happens when you, for instance, inhale smoke. So inhale cigarette smoke, for instance. Um, so what? So the smoke brings in a number of molecules. I mean, the core molecule of interest for instance is nicotine which is not the subject of what I'm going to talk about that's the that's the stimulation molecule but smoke brings in all kinds of other things which are called um, hydrocarbons of various kinds so various sorts of molecules that are there in the in in all the paraphernalia that surrounds the nicotine so this this is the molecule that's coming in from the outside so this variable value is being increased by the environment by our habits so to say by the environment as a result of that the cell has a particular molecule that it keeps, the program keeps the, the levels of this molecule constantly at, a, it's called the AHR molecule. It keeps it at a certain level and the goal of keeping it at that level is to say that when these molecules come in, when the variable values of these molecules are increased, this molecule is the sentinel, the guard that goes and captures these molecules, so to say, it binds to them, captures them and drags them deep inside into the dungeons of the nucleus. So once once these these invading molecules are captured and brought into the nucleus the program senses that and says there's something bad happening here i now need to manufacture one of these molecules that whose recipes are sitting inside inside the program and one of those molecules is called it's got a name it's called sip 1a1 so it starts manufacturing more of that molecule so it is increasing the variable levels of that molecule so the program is simply watching looking at the variables levels and that's what programs do, look at a particular state of the variables, replace those set of variables by a new set of values and that evolution continues. So this, the variable value of this molecule is increasing. The goal of this molecule, creating this molecule is that it knows how to chop this up into small pieces and push it out of the system. So this guy just simply goes through what is called a drug metabolic process, which is a fancy name for saying that it chops up these invading molecules and makes uh, converts them into a form where the the body's um, um, so, uh, sort of cleaning machinery can push it out and uh, these things just go out through you know, the urine for instance so so that gives you an example of you know what when you think of this as a program what is this program doing 
what are the variables, what are the variables coming in from outside, how is the program sort of reacting in response and setting its own variables to combat the variables that are being set from the outside so that the natural state of the variables can be set back to a state where the cell is happy to live and survive. Um, now, there are a few catches in this design and one of those is what I want to point out next is that I, I told you at the beginning that every cell is executing the same program and that's what unifies all of them. There's nothing else stopping a cell from running away and doing, saying that I want to do what I want to do and not what everybody else is doing. And that would be disaster for any sort of cooperative environment as you can see. Now, since every cell is executing the same programs, there is discipline enforced. The program itself is largely a read-only program that there are recipes for molecules in there. The program can sense the variable values that are being forced by the, by the environment and appropriately make changes. But the program itself is not changing. Now, that is partly true, partly not true. What happens as a result of a lot of these drug metabolic processes, wherever you have invading uh, molecules coming in from outside that are getting chopped up, there's a flaw in the design that causes a side effect, namely that uh, these, these things called reactive oxygen species are a side effect of those reactions that chop up these invading molecules. And these, these things um, have this unfortunate side effect of actually violating this read-only nature of the program and they actually write into the program, unfortunately. And they do what is called DNA modification, they change the program. Now this is largely, this is not, this is an exception rather than the rule. As a rule, the, you know, the program is read-only. But um, just as you have read-only memories, you know, they're read-only, but if you go and hit them with a the hammer, obviously the things are going to change. Likewise, I mean, this is like an extra constitutional way to sort of modify uh, the program. And the program does get modified in bits and pieces. Um, That's okay. Uh, so, the, the program again has the ability to sense that it's being written into. I mean, that's the amazing thing about evolution that it's given us all of these protective mechani mechanisms. So, the program is changing and it has the ability to sense that it's changing and it has the ability to then correct for those changes. But all of those are, you know, have limits to it. And so, over a period of time, over a period of years of, you know, years of one's lifetime, over a period of years of these the small levels of um, the read-only program actually being written into, the program starts looking different. And then the cell with the different program decides that I'm no longer doing what everybody else is doing, I'm doing my own thing. And that leads to a bunch of diseases including you know, cancer is the most common uh, disease that results from that, that behavior. But you can see that the system that we are dealing with is not very unlike what we are used to. It's, we, um, we are taught biology completely differently. We are taught as if it's, it's something else. It's to do with frogs and mice and rats. At the end of the day, it's a program. It's a program that is remarkably interesting from the perspective of being a truly distributed program that still keeps things together, but yet things drift apart once in a while. The other interesting thing about this program, and I don't know whether any, there's this horrendous program that I've you know, put out here, and I don't know whether some of you would uh, probably be able to spot it if you would. Long time ago, we used to, you know, we used to have this challenge question, can you write a program that outputs itself, so that replicates itself. So if you write a program, when you run it, it should print itself out. And you can see that this is not easy because let's say you have, you say print something, that something will get printed, but the print statement itself won't get printed. Right? So the output has to be the same as the, the program itself. So now you say there is something, you declare a string variable and say print that string variable. The variable gets printed, but the print statement itself is not printed. Uh, how do you make the print statement itself print? And you know, so you've got to go through a few tricks and so on to do that, and you'll realize that you have to use loops of some form to do that. Uh, so there are two statements in the program. The, first, the second statement will first print the first line, and then it has to print the second line. But you can't have two print statements because then you'll have two print statements and you'll have three lines to print. So you need the second statement to be a loop and so on. So you can see that there's some complexity of, of thinking that has to go in into creating a program that prints itself. And, and very interestingly, the programs that all of our cells run, and 
is a program that's capable of printing itself. It's capable of um, reproducing and creating another a complete new copy of itself. When it creates a complete new copy of itself, again there is a small violation of that read-only rule that the program creates a complete copy, but it makes a few changes to it. Those few changes are sometimes bad, sometimes good. They are good in the sense that that's what leads to the uh, the large variety of life forms that inhabit our planet, or the, even the large variety of races that uh, humankind has. They all look different somewhat, some are you know, dark skinned, some are light skinned, some are tall, short, etc. And those variations arise from the fact that when this program reproduces itself, it makes a few changes. Um, those changes are not too many, so if you look at uh, roughly about one in a thousand characters gets changed. So here there's a character that's changed, here there's a character that's changed, and this is roughly to scale, meaning there are about a thousand characters in between these two. So these changes can be just changing one character to another, or it can be that you just remove a character and you know, just take it out and put nothing back in return, or you can remove a long chunk, for instance, maybe ten characters out and things like that. On the average, it's about one in a thousand. So if you take um, somebody from Africa and somebody from Asia, China, Indonesia, wherever you take, whichever part of the world, humans, they're all just, their differences are only one in a thousand. So in that sense, they're remarkably similar. There's barely any difference, you could say. Now the quest is, so we have this program that each of our cells runs. The program that you run is slightly different from the program that I run because of the reasons that I mentioned. And that is what makes you different from me. And because you're different from me, you would look different, you might behave differently, you might have a set of characteristics that is different. And the quest of science is clearly to understand what is it about this program here that leads you to become tall but keeps me short or for that causes a particular person to get a particular disease, etc. So the, clearly this one in thousand variation is, even though it looks like a small variation, it's, it's big enough for all of us to look very different, behave very differently, for some of us to unfortunately get diseases that the others don't have, for some of us to have exceptionally long lifespans while the others have exceptionally short lifespans, etc. So these, these small differences is what one wants to study and see if there's a, one can at, you know, at some point in the future be able to uh, correlate these differences to, uh, to the various behavioral and uh, so-called phenotypical differences and variety that exists. not sure what the text at the bottom is, so ignore. Uh, so what we need today is, is some sort of instrument, implement that can allow us to see the, the program inside each of us. And um, if, um, and that's the first stage, so we need to be able to see what the program is inside us before we can get to the next more interesting stage of saying, now we understand what are the differences that all of us have and now we can start correlating these differences to behavioral differences and then eventually get actionable information that will allow us to say since we have you have this difference you're likely to you know have this sort of maybe disease coming up in the future and this is what you can do about it pre proactively so at this point we are simply talking of the very first primitive step in this in this whole journey which is can we see that that program can we see the individual at an individual level, not, not at a course level, but at an individual level where, where we can see the one in thousand changes that each of us has. And the reason I'm giving this talk today is simply that over the last 20, 30 years, substantial progress has been made towards you know, building that set of spectacles. And it's, it's a complex set of spectacles, and, but, but not too complex in the sense that, so here is how those glasses look like. You, you take this little test tube and you put a, you know, you spit into it, literally, and then you send it to a lab. In that lab, there's an instrument um, where you, you run, run this, this saliva through a few steps and dump it into this instrument. And all in all, it will cost, at today's rate, about $5,000. And out will come some data from which you can literally see the individual changes that you have compared to what everybody else has. 
um, five thousand dollars is is you know tantalizingly close to being something that is low enough and, and the rate at which this cost is decreasing is substantial as well and the expectations are that it will be definitely sub thousand dollars in a couple of years from now and so that's tantalizingly close to the point where you, you could say this the expense is no longer an issue now maybe we can really identify differences in lots and lots of people you know, people run it at a population scale and get to the more interesting level of understanding what is it about these differences that actually translates into disease or not okay so now i come to the computational part and the algorithms part of saying what comes out of this machine and what uh, what does that have to do with big data and what sorts of algorithms are needed uh, to complete the set of spectacles meaning take what comes out of this machine and at the end output here are the places where you are different so you gave your saliva in here and so here are the places the one in thousand places where you are different and here is how you are different right the the way the machine on the pre previous slide works is that it so the program so your saliva has cells inside it and each of the cells is executing the same program that we talked about and somehow the machine extracts that program out of that saliva uh, and it it of course doesn't just take one copy of the program it takes many many copies because this it's an inherently erroneous process so you want fault tolerance in some form by taking many copies and reading all of those simultaneously so it takes many copies of the same program um you don't know any of the characters in this program yet all you know is that the program is sitting somewhere inside the test tube and it it does a number of crazy things to it and it's it's actually mind boggling to at the end look at it and say all of this comes together and accurately gives you at the end uh exactly the places where you differ from every you know everybody else but it does all kinds of things so what it's going to do is to chop up this these these many copies of the program into small pieces so it's just randomly chop up you know, close your eyes and just cut them you cut them because this molecule is so huge that it's very hard to manipulate it as a whole you've got to chop it up into small pieces so that they are manageable and then what you do is you end up reading reading meaning that um you end up taking each of these pieces and reading a little bit from this end and and potentially a little bit from the other end so about about 100 characters from each end and that's all that the machine is capable of doing today ideally it should be reading that whole thing today it's just capable of reading about 100 pieces from this end and 100 from that end before errors start piling up and take it beyond the realm of you know, re recovery so what you get as a result is a lot of these small snippets so you had the whole program to begin with it's been many copies have been taken and chopped up into just pieces of about length 100 each so you've got lots and lots of these small pieces and that's what the machine spits out so if you, you know spend that $5000 and give you a saliva you'll get back a file which contains these snippets and there'll be about a billion of these snippets each of length 100 in what you get back and that's where the connection to big data comes in that in a very i mean it's not the conventional big data but just large amounts of data uh, on which now you have to run the right types of algorithms to be able to recover take these pieces and then come to the conclusion that here are the places where my program is different from everybody else um you can now imagine how so now we are stepping out from the realm of um uh, biology or if you want to call it you know as i said everything is program so you know carbon based programs as, as opposed to silicon based programs now maybe the the future uh, sort of nomenclature which uh, you know narrows the the distance between these two fields but uh stepping into the world of algorithms and computing and uh, how do you take all of those small pieces and and bring them together uh, into what we want so one way is to start taking these pieces and what is called assembling them so you take a piece here take another piece and if this piece has a long suffix that's identical or close to identical to a prefix of this piece it's a good guess to say that these two pieces actually came from the same place in in the program and that you can piece them together and now you could run this procedure repeatedly to start piecing things together into and hopefully 
if you're lucky, you'll get the big program back at, at the end. Right? So our problem is that the program was huge, three billion, you know, long stretch, and what the machine gave us was all these chopped up small pieces, and we're trying to piece, piece it back together, and this is one way to do it. The challenge in this is that very soon you run into this combinatorial explosion of many, many possibilities so that this piece not only nicely you know, jigsaw fits into this piece, it also fits into 10 other pieces. And each of those might fit into 10 other pieces. But only one of those is the right piece that came from the right place in the program. And you don't know which one. And so you've got to explore this search space and that explodes very fast. And then very soon you're in a, you're in a situation where uh, of course you're running out of time, you're running, you know, there's plenty of memory, plenty of time needed. and all of that, and uh, it, uh, it's also at some level completely infeasible to actually bring back the entire sequence from this. Um, so now, how do we then proceed? So what happened 10 years ago was a big step in allowing us to proceed. And 10 years ago, there was this major effort, uh, which was a culmination of several years of work which was called Sequencing of the Human Genome, the Human Genome Project. And the goal of that project was not the goal that I've laid out today, which is that on an individual basis, we want to assess what differences you have relative to me. The goal of that project was to say on a species basis, as, as the Homo sapiens species, what does our, our program look like? So it's not your program, my program, or anybody's program, but some rough draft of what all of our programs on the average sort of look like. So they took maybe five people, you know, five people, and said, "We'll pull all of their their programs together, and then we'll read it." And they had to go through this piecing process that I talked to on the previous slide, and it took several years, several, you know, literally hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to do this. Uh, took lots of time, lots of combinations of experimental tricks to limit the combinatorial explosion that was happening with the computation and uh, combined with uh, effective computation, etc. And they eventually managed over several years to actually piece together um, one copy of the human genome, one representative copy, which is, uh, which is, as I said, some five people's copies. But um, this is not a procedure that can be run on a regular basis if you were to walk in into a lab and say, I want to know my program. Because this takes too much time, it takes too much effort, it goes for years, it, you know, it needs a big big, and you can see the number of people who worked on this. But what this gave us is that it gave us one representative sequence, one representative program. Uh, and as I said, most people are no different from one in thousands, right? So in which case, if you have one representative program, now we have, so if I were to measure my genome, I already have what is called a reference genome, which is, I know is not very different from mine. I know I'm different in one in a thousand. And now the task is, I have all these little snippets with me, but I have also this reference program to go by, which I can use to uh, reduce the computation space. And um, so, so let's say this is the reference program. It's called the reference sequence. Um, it's a one-time effort that's been done, and now we have it to use on, on, on an ongoing basis. And we've got all of these little snippets that have come because you've walked in and want to read your, your program or your genome. So how do we use this reference sequence to piece together all these little snippets? And the way we use that is that we convert it to a search problem. So we say, you search, you're no longer trying to take these pieces and piece them together. You now, in the context of the reference genome, all you're doing to do, trying to do is to search for these pieces in the reference genome. So these pieces are all strings of length 100. This is a long string of length 3 billion. And this is a search where you're searching. But remember, since you are going to be different from this reference genome in 1 in 1,000 places, the search has to tolerate errors. It has to tolerate mismatches and gaps. So the differences between you and the reference could also be that some parts are removed or some parts are added. So the search has to you know, tolerate mismatches and gaps, much like if you were to do, for instance, an Oxford English Dictionary search, you would give you would give a word, and you would typically expect that the search is an exact search. It should locate the exactly that word and give you its meaning. Sometimes when you're doing Google search, for instance, you want to type in something approximate, and you want it to correct for typos or even you know, approximate uh, spellings, etc. So this is that sort of a search. And 
so basically now we've reduced the computation problem to a to a problem that all of us are probably familiar up now with and which which we use in our daily lives which is a standard search problem and this is how uh, once so here is one of those little snippets and here's the reference genome and here is an example of how the the little snippet may be slightly different from the reference so there might be a g here instead of a c and these two places the reference had two t's and that's been completely removed from from the genome that got measured so so something like this is what you want to search for you want to say that this string here matches here if it matches within a finite no, a small number of mismatches and what are called gaps and so this is a classic problem of indexing the reference genome so you want to index the genome for fast approximate searches much like we index google indexes text so it takes all the web pages and it converts it into a certain data structure so that when you come up with the search key the time taken for the search is typically a function of the length of the search query and largely independent of the length of the corpus that's being searched so if you didn't do the indexing you would have to go through the corpus and that would take time proportional at least to the size of the corpus but the goal of indexing is to take you know do it one time index that corpus one time so that the time taken for a search is more a function of the query as opposed to a function of the corpus and exactly that's what you want to do here except that the the, the notion of approximation may be a little different from what typically you use in other situations so if you are building a dictionary you would do the same you would take the oxford english dictionary index it so that when you get a word you can quickly you know check where that word is and what its meaning is without searching through the whole dictionary literally speaking and i'll i'll just give you a 5 minute introduction i have 10 minutes i think so i'll give you a 5 minute introduction sorry 5 minutes left oh that's it okay um then um i'm going to skip pretty much to the algorithms uh except say that the indexing for you know approximate matches is usually a little difficult to do so you, you end up indexing for exact matches and um and then what you do is you take these snippets you look for substrings that match exactly out here and then once you've got an anchor you try to extend it using what's called dynamic programming it's a standard method to look for strings which are close to the string query string that you have and then you know there are a number of data structures suffix trees uh interesting very interesting data structures that i wanted to talk about but no time so this um uh, the burrows wheeler transforms etc and all of that ensures that you can actually do all of this computation now and depending on the amount of memory you have etc in about hours so you no know, 40 hours or 15 hours depending on whether you have 4 gigabytes or you no know, 20 gigabytes of memory and then you can speed that up using what are called graphics processors which means uh, you know you've got a single card with thousands you no know, literally hundreds of cores in it and if you were to use that you can actually get it down to a few hours and we are working now to get it actually down to maybe the goal is about 3 hours or so and that's doable we feel so that's that's the computational problem uh now let me spend the next 3 or 4 minutes in telling you what impact this can have so now you walk in you give your saliva you pay 5000 dollars you get all these little snippets you go through this process and at the end of it you you get uh you know for each snippet you know where it arises in the in the um in the genome then um um then when you when you take all of these snippets and put them at the right place where they aligned in the genome naturally you'll start seeing where you differ from from the reference and these are the places where you know the snippet has a different value than the reference and so those are the places where you differ and then you so basically you've identified that and now what can you do with that so i want to give you one example in the last couple of minutes which is what you can do with that is a variety of things it gives you a lot of information a lot of that information the actionability of that information is still a big you know area of research but the one area that is um, uh, i want to talk about just give you one example is all of us are carriers for various sorts of diseases uh luckily those diseases don't manifest because we have one copy of the program each of us has two copies one from the pa- one from each parent we have one copy that's that sort of has the bad uh bad gene so to say and one copy that has the good and one copy is one good copy is good uh, good enough to protect us but when there are two bad copies then the disease manifests all of us are carriers meaning we have one bad copy 
and then we, if we happen to mate with another person who also has a bad copy, there's a good chance that the offspring will have a bad cop two bad copies and the disease manifests. So one application for this is simply to see what all are we carriers for and therefore what are our children at risk for. Now this is not something that happens, the frequencies are relatively rare, it's like one in thousand, one in five thousand, etc. But over a billion people, one in five thousand can be quite a lot. So here is one classic example, it's a 25 base pair deletion, 25 characters get deleted and um, it causes what's called uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it's very interesting in the sense that this is an Indian mutation. It's known to occur only in India. It, uh, it's known to have arisen about 30,000 years ago in India. Only people in India have it. Nobody else in the world has it. And interestingly, 5% of us are carriers for this. So as carriers, we'll be largely okay, except as we grow older, the, the, uh, there will be you know, heart disease manifestations that will occur. And so even as carriers, this is useful information for us to say that we need to get checked periodically because the disease as itself, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, typically manifests itself in sudden death and you read all these you know, footballers dying on the football field, this is what they die of. So 5% of us are carriers which means we'll have milder symptoms that show up over you know, as we age. But if two carriers have a child, then the child will have an acute case which will manifest itself in sudden death on the football field. Right? So this is one reason why we need to sort of know about what is inside our program. There are many other reasons, but I don't have time. So with that, I will end and uh, thank you very much and open up for questions. A few questions. Thanks for your talk, uh, Mr. Hariharan. So, I have a question for you. Um, clearly, this is this task is probably more than the big data task, the complex data task. How would you uh, look at it? Is it the size, typically, that we've been discussing since yesterday, or is it the complexity? In the, the size and the big data problems are interesting challenges, but in the, if you look at a scheme of things over, they are not challenges that are going, that are going to challenge us for, for decades for sure. Even for years, I would say they are challenges that will challenge us for months and you know, couple of years and those will get solved. Right? So, so the big data problem that I talked about, the algorithmic problems that I talked about, once they get solved and once the prices of sequencing come down and sequencing sort of becomes ubiquitous that many, many people get sequenced. Then there'll be the next big data problem that, um, for instance, what, what do most of you, you know, look at when you talk about big data? You talk about mining retail data, mining financial data. This will be yet another pool of data that will come your way. So you'll have a billion people on earth with all of their, you know, their variations from everybody else sitting somewhere and all of their maybe, you know, information on whether they are tall, short, whether they have this disease or that. So that will be yet another pool of the data that will come your way and that you know, I'm sure there will be talks on just as you mine retail data and financial data, you'll be talking about how to mine that data. So that's, that's one from a big data perspective. The key problems from a real science perspective are can we understand how those variations really impact the biology of you know, disease and then can we figure out ways to avoid disease or cure disease. So that's the hard problem. I think that nobody knows today how long that's going to go. That's it's the beginning of the journey today. Uh, Ramesh? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one being uh, when you are doing all this personal genomics, uh, when you know that you are a carrier of so, some particular gene, how does psychology play a role in that? Uh, second question is, uh, how long will it take, uh, do you think, that for the doctors to start prescribing medicines on your genotype? Um, psychology is an important issue, but uh, like several other issues, it's a question of getting used to it, and uh, it will, you know, that as awareness builds up, it's more, a, it's more an issue of knowledge, education. You know, as awareness builds up, and as we realize that things are. Um, you know, things are actionable, meaning that 
particularly if you're a carrier, a carrier is really the, the best piece of information that you can get. It doesn't impact you as much. It will impact the next generation potentially, and you have enough time to, you know, uh, take action to, to, um, to avoid that impact. So a carrier is really the simplest of, you know, of the problems. There are many other things that could, that could be more uh, troubling, but it does play a role, and you know, it's, it's a challenge, and uh, over time, you know, we, you know, we'll have to see how that sorts out. But there are being psychological studies done today on, on does it really impact. The only study that I know of concluded that uh, while this knowledge doesn't seem to trouble anybody exceptionally beyond a period of a week or so, it also doesn't um, force them into taking uh, action. For instance, if you discover you have you know, that you should be exercising a lot more because you have potential for heart disease, it doesn't really force you to start exercising a lot more either. So that's 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 the only, no, that's the conclusion of whatever study that you know, that I've known of. Um, how soon is, will it be before doctors start doing personalized medicine? I had two examples on my last slide of things that are happening today. Of course, they're not happening in you know, every health center on earth, but in certain you know, in thought leader hospitals, etc., that's starting to happen. So I had two examples, very nice examples, which I didn't go over. But uh, the answer is, in small you know small numbers, it started. And uh, you know, it will just increase over time. Ramesh, uh, do you think uh, sometime in the future people will start looking at uh, genome types before selecting life partners? Uh, you tell me. I mean, that's a, you know, it's all our job is to put this information out and then how you use it, what you do with it. You know, do you look at uh, what the person bought at Walmart before you decide whether you're going to buy, uh, marry them? Do you look at you know, their stock profiles before you decide you're going to marry them? you look at their Aadhaar, uh, whatever, no, whatever, there'll be a talk later today, I assume, and they'll tell you what they store. Um, you decide whether you look at their genotype as well before you marry. Ramesh, one last question. One quick question here. Yes. This side. Yes. In terms of the indexing, I understood the big data going towards the index. Is it finally something akin to a lucene index? If so, how are you tolerating the jitters? No, 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 no lucene indices. These are all very specialized indices that one has to build. Um, uh, these are very specialized problems. So, yes, so we don't use general purpose indices. And so you, do, you need to, do you find that you need to shard the indices? Or uh, do they fit in one unit? They don't fit in, so depending on what you mean by, so they don't fit in one, depending on how much RAM you have. So these indices will happily fit into about so the good thing about these indices is the way these algorithms are designed, they have a very nice time-space trade-off. So you decide, you tell me how much RAM you have. The same program, the same index will work, but I'll sample it so that it will fit into that much memory at the expense of increased time of running. Is there enough locality that you can page things in and out of the disk, or do you need it all in memory at one time? So the index has to be in memory, but as I said, okay. you can sample these indices so that if you have only so much memory, so the, uh, that's the nice property about these indices. You can reconstruct from sampled information, and that's, that's, uh, and that's what you use primarily. So whatever memory you have, will fit into that much memory. Thank you.